praise the Lord to all of you. This is the first time that we are doing anything like this in which I am at the moment preaching to an empty church. That's not usually what I like to do, but today it's for, of course, a special cause and reason, and that is because we are having a virtual service here today as we honor the government's request that we limit the size of gatherings for the moment to limit the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And so we are gathered here together in our own homes and different spaces. And so that we can join together in God's word, God can speak to us and we can be a church a called out group of believers that are brought together and so that we can learn God's word, we can love one another, we can love God, and we can reach lost the lost with the gospel. And it is my hope that we can do that today and also to bring some peace, some perspective in the midst of what has been a tense crisis and time of fear here in our culture. And for that reason, I'm going to be talking to you today about how we can have perfect peace, even in 2020. And so I'm going to read to you from Isaiah chapter 26 and verses 3 and 4. If you want to join with me in your Bibles, it says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. Also, Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Join with me, if you would, right now in prayer that God would speak into your hearts. Wherever you are right now, I believe that the presence of God can come into that place and that God can speak to you through His Word. Lord Jesus, we come before you right now and we ask for your help, Lord, during this time. I know, God, that there are those that, Lord, are listening to my voice right now, God, that are going through a time of fear and turmoil in their lives. I'm asking, O oh God, that your peace would speak into their lives right now, that you would touch their hearts, and that your word, God, would lift them up and encourage them, that they would turn their eyes to the hills from whence comes their help. Our help come from you, Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Help us and be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you happen to stand for the reading of God's word, you can be seated. How the world has changed in the last couple of weeks. A couple of weeks ago, the media was business as usual, all the typical drivel, you know, politics and the complaints about the politicians, sports and entertainers and the gossip about their personal lives and uh, the things that were going on around them. There was the typical fear mongering over climate change and the latest social justice issues, the things that are going to kill us and destroy us right around the corner. People were concerned with all of the typical trivialities. Sure, many of us knew that there was a virus that originated in Wuhan, China, and had shown up in other countries, and even that it was starting to be labeled a pandemic. But it was a distant curiosity. But then the panic hit North America, and business as usual suddenly vanished. The stock market began to crash in levels not seen in decades. And after a few athletes tested positive for the virus, one professional sporting league after another announced that they were going to shut down operations for the immediate future. Schools here in Ontario and elsewhere announced that they would be closed for at least an additional two weeks after the March break. And day by day, we watched as more and more restrictions were put in place, more safeguards were implemented, and more and more places of business begin to close down and respond to the, the crises in the attempt to prevent a further crisis that was upon us. We've now reached a place, of course, as you know, where many businesses have shut down, people are recommended to stay in their homes, and here we are having church in a virtual rather than a physical space. And along with all of this comes a fairly obvious amount of fear. This is uncharted waters for our modern culture. And even Pastor Kingsley, who will be 80 years old later on this year, states that he has never seen anything like this in all of his lifetime. I suspect that's true for you as well. And so I want to address two things in this message here today. First of all, to answer the question as to whether or not we should be afraid. 
Secondly, I want to demonstrate to you that we can have peace, even if it feels like the world is falling apart. So first of all, should we be afraid? The good news is that the short answer is no. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So because of that, I can say with absolute certainty that we should not be afraid. But let me just add a little bit of perspective to that. As many of you know, I like to do my research, do my homework, and so I began to carefully research the numbers when it came to COVID-19 about a week ago, as unfortunately our media has been out of control with the fear-mongering. And so I started to monitor the numbers here in North America and around the world, and have watched it throughout this past week in detail. And first of all, I will certainly attest to the fact that the numbers have been growing steadily throughout this past week. And I believe that that is actually, you know, common sense and that we have become much more aggressive with testing. And of course, the more that you test, the likelihood is is that the more that you will find. And so we see particularly here in North America that the number of cases has been growing with some rapidity. According to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, there are about 20,000 cases in the United States. As of this moment, understand that all these numbers that I give, it's a very fluid situation. It changes by the moment. And so uh, there is also about 1,000 cases here in Canada. The first documented case in Canada was in late January with uh, some of the early cases documented in the United States in early February. I want you to understand that every life matters. Every life matters to God. Every life should matter to us as individuals. And so what I am about to say, in no way does it make light of the real pain and trauma of people. But I do want to illustrate a point about fear. Thus far in the United States, there have been somewhere over 200 deaths attributed to COVID-19. Every life matters, of course, but to give some perspective, 7,452 people die on average every day in the United States to one cause or another. So over the past month where we have been tracking the the rise of of COVID-19 here in North America, some 223,300 people have died due to some other cause in the United States compared to the somewhere between 200 and 300 deaths attributed to COVID-19. Also, there are 123, unfortunately, that commit suicide every day in the United States, or about 3,700 people during that same period. So somewhere around 3,400 to 3,500 more people in the United States have chosen to end their lives during those that's this past month than those whose lives were taken by complications due to COVID-19. In Canada, there have been 13 people thus far that have died from COVID-19. Each one of those deaths is a tragedy, but just to give perspective, nearly 780 people die in Canada every day due to some other cause. That's 23,400 over that same period of time, including more than 10 daily suicides or over 300 suicides during that time. And so, once again, about 10 times as many people have elected to take their lives than what have been taken by COVID-19 over that same period of time. Here in our province of Ontario, there are 377 people out of 14,570,000 people that have been affected by COVID-19. That is 0.0025%. Of course... All of this is fluid. All of these numbers can change. But again, for perspective, in the 2017-2018 flu season, there were more than 61,000 deaths from the flu around the world. Thus far this flu season, there have been more than 45 million people infected with the flu globally and about 46,000 deaths. There are estimated to have been worldwide around 12,000 that have died from COVID-19 to this point. Now, that's not to say that those numbers may not change, but while the statistics change from day to day, there's a point that I want to make. And to be clear, my point is not to minimize the dangers of COVID-19. I don't want to encourage some kind of cavalier attitude within you, nor do I want to diminish the tragedy of each life lost. But I do want to make a point about fear. 
Here in North America, things will almost certainly get worse before they get better. But I'm encouraged by the fact that in places like China and South Korea, the infection seems to have run its course. The numbers are dropping and life is starting to get back to normal. I believe that this is something that, like everything, will pass. But the question is, is why are we so consumed with fear over COVID-19 and not consumed with fear to the same degree over the flu? The flu, by numbers, has already killed far more this year and will kill far more people on an average basis per year than what COVID-19 or anything similar to it has. So why are we so afraid? Why is our society shutting down over this when it doesn't over the flu? I think that in many ways the answer is because we are familiar with the flu. It's a familiar Ill illness that most of us get every year. And because we have personal experience with it, we know that we will probably survive it. We may know that statistically people do die from the flu, but most of the time when we hear that someone who is sick has the flu rather than some other illness, we're relieved because we are familiar with it. And we know that most of the time, most people survive it, which by the way is also true of COVID-19. The media doesn't obsess over the flu. Politicians don't make speeches about it. Sports leagues don't close down over it. Restaurants don't close and the government doesn't advise us to stop having church over it. And so because people aren't told to be afraid, or maybe they don't listen even if they are because of their own life experience, they aren't afraid. But this is an unknown. And because so many are publicly panicking, and because the media has become obsessed with this, our countries are ripping themselves apart in fear. But I want to give you this perspective when it comes to the question of whether or not you should be afraid. If it weren't for the media and for social media, there's a very strong chance that you wouldn't even know that you were supposed to be afraid right now, because most all of you have been personally unaffected by this nor has anyone that you know been affected by this. A big part of the reason why we're afraid is because it is an unknown, because it is so widely publicized, because there's such a strong reaction in our culture. And I don't know enough to know whether that reaction is justified or not when it comes to some of the, the various details that are being implemented to try to stop the spread of COVID-19. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not trying to pretend to be one. My point is, is about fear. People are afraid of this, even though they're not afraid of other common illnesses that statistically have killed more this year and maybe may end up killing more this year anyway, because it is something that is familiar. There is fear in the unknown, and it's very clear that the peace that we knew a couple of weeks ago and our culture and our society where everything seemed to be going reasonably well, suddenly that peace has been shattered and torn apart. So why is our peace so fragile? I submit to you it's because our culture doesn't really understand peace. Now, peace is a popular word. Everybody loves the concept of peace. It's a buzzword for politicians, celebrities, the media, and even beauty pageant contestants that all seem to want world peace. During the Vietnam era, it became the theme of the hippie counterculture, and their image of the peace sign was permanently burned upon the public consciousness. The hippie version of peace was a world in which there was no war, no conflict. It borrowed the concept of a wide open community from communism, except in this case it was an idyllic version in which everyone was equal and everyone shared in common without the need for government or intrusion from authority. Their theme was make love, not war. This culture was infatuated with the concept of a society without rules, without barriers, no authority, no consequence, free drugs, free love, free sex. Young people across North America threw off their restraints, the expectations of society, and they rebelled. It was all about peace, or so we were told. But this movement did not produce peace. In fact, many of the peace protests turned very violent. There was a violent upheaval and shattering of our culture, all in the name of peace. 
There was an explosive rise of drug use and its damaging effects upon the human body and mind, which in many ways has helped to fuel the, the problems that our culture has right now with mental illness. Furthermore, the sexually transmitted diseases, decay of morality, the decay of the family tore apart many homes and has created a, a climate of hostility, of brokenness that many of you know firsthand the effects of what it's like to come from a broken home. The concepts of everything free, of peace, of no restraints, of this idyllic situation where there was no consequence, it was a fantasy land. It was not real peace, and it certainly did not bring about a positive, lasting change in our culture. In fact, history shows that man's attempts to create peace have always failed. In fact, they have often created a climate in which there is more war, there is more bloodshed. The Roman peace, the Pax Romana, was enforced at the end of the legionnaires' gladius. They killed millions and enslaved many millions more and crucified hundreds of thousands to enforce peace. Peace for Romans, maybe, not necessarily for everyone else. You see, the problem is, is that man doesn't really understand the word peace. To many, the idea of peace is this fuzzy feeling of well-being that only comes on a perfect, idyllic day. The sun is shining, but not too hot. A gentle breeze is blowing, but not too hard. There is no stress, no conflict, no responsibilities, no death, no sickness, no debt, no negatives at all. North Americans have become obsessed with avoiding anything that causes us suffering or hardship. So we try to find this utopian concept of peace, but we are constantly frustrated. We try to conquer war or sickness, poverty, famine, danger to the environments, violence in general. We think by the force of our will that we can overpower these things and we can create peace. But as we have found, these are always doomed endeavors because as long as sin exists in our world, people will always fall short of their normal intentions. So no matter how hard we desire this idyllic sense of peace or how hard we try to fight against conflict or hardship or suffering, we cannot stop it. We cannot stop sickness. We cannot stop financial difficulties from coming. Conflict is inevitable. Conflict is going to enter our lives. And if your definition of peace is an absence of conflict, you're not going to have much peace in your life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 says, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. While we were traveling on our vacation this last week, we listened to an audio dramatization of the once popular series of the Left Behind books. Our kids had never heard it, and so we wanted to share it with them to maybe trigger their thought processes a little bit. And if you're familiar at all with the series, it fictionally describes the rapture and the great tribulation, along with the Antichrist rise to power. And one thing that kind of leaps out to you as you listen to the series or read the book is that the Antichrist bait, so to speak, in which he, he rises to power is the, the promise of peace. In fact, according to Daniel 9.27, the event that begins the Great Tribulation is the signing of a covenant with the Jewish people, an act of peace. So in a world of chaos, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, someone who promises peace and safety will be able to convince people to turn control over to him. So clearly we don't want the kind of peace, quote unquote, that the Antichrist offers as the book of Revelation reveals that he actually comes to conquer and then war, famine, and death follow in his wake. So that version of peace is not what we're looking for either. So what is real peace? Well, let's look at the word. The word peace is defined from the Greek um, in a variety of ways in Thayer's Bible Dictionary. It could be a state of national tranquility. It could be exemption from the rage and havoc of war. It could be peace between individuals, harmony or concord. It could be security, safety, prosperity. 
It can be the Messiah's peace. It can be the way that leads to peace, salvation. And then finally, the most accurate one for the Christian. It says, of Christianity, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is. Now, these definitions indicate that there is a unique kind of peace that goes beyond the typical definitions of the word that we read earlier on. That there is a kind of peace that is unique to Christians, unique to the righteous. Does Scripture uphold that notion? It certainly does. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 20. And it says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So God says in Isaiah that there is no peace for the wicked. And Jesus says that he gives a kind of peace that the world cannot give. I submit to you that perfect peace is impossible to find outside of Jesus Christ, who is called the Prince of Peace in Scripture. But why is it? Well, it's not because the righteous are always shielded from adversity. Jesus said this in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus makes a really clear statement here, and that is that we will have tribulation while we are in the world. There is an assurance that we will have tribulation. He stated this matter-of-factly. This is a reality that cannot be disputed. When we became a Christian, we did not receive an exemption from life. There is right now a United Pentecostal minister who has passed away from COVID-19 related illness. And I think that illustrates a point to all of us. That God didn't make us a promise that we are going to be exempted, exempted from every hardship that comes. But there is going to be tribulation that is a part of this life. And so for some people that very realization says, well then I can't have peace. But I argue to you today that that is not true. Jesus says that you will have tribulation. He says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus is promising that no matter what we might go through, no matter what we might face, it is all under His control. And we have a promise that all things work together for the good of them that are called according to God's purpose. So God has given us a promise that while we will go through tribulation, don't worry, it's under His control. And He is going to work things together for our good. We understand that as Christians, the very fact of being a Christian means that you're probably going to have more conflict in life. You're going to have to go against the flow sometimes and have an opinion that is not the prevailing opinion. And as a result of that, there is going to be conflict. But Jesus says, don't worry, I have overcome the world. I can give victory in every situation. Very clearly, our peace does not come from an absence of conflict. So where then does it come from? What do the righteous have that the wicked do not? If God says the wicked do not have peace in the way that God defines it, what is it that the righteous have that the wicked do not? The first thing that we have is inner peace. Part of the wages of sin is a constant inner turmoil. Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 8 that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so that tells us in an implied negative that there is condemnation to those who are not in Christ Jesus. And you know that firsthand. You know what it was like before you came to the Lord, how that there was a burden of heaviness upon you, and how that you felt that guilt and condemnation, that there were times that you looked in the mirror and you hated what you saw reflected there. You know what it's like to go to bed at night with a heaviness upon you, a burden because of your sinfulness. And so the promise that we have is that we can have an inner peace. People want to pretend that there is no consequence to the wages of sin, but we all know better, don't we? We know that there is a terrible price to pay for sin, a weight of sin that rests upon us. Maybe it's the morning after or when the buzz or the high or the pleasure is over 
And all we are left with is that feeling of self-loathing. But if you have come to the Lord Jesus Christ and your sins have been forgiven, your sins have been tossed in a sea of forgetfulness, forever buried and gone, then you know the kind of inner peace that comes from having your sins forgiven, your past erased, and having not only a new start in Jesus Christ, but walking in the light with Him and having peace day by day. I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to someone who has repented of their sins or been baptized in Jesus' name or filled with His Spirit, and they've responded to me after that, I feel so clean. I feel so light. I feel like a burden has been lifted off my shoulders. I feel peace. I never felt like this before. That is the kind of inner peace that Jesus alone can give. The second thing that we have is a confidence for the future. It's very clear when you begin to ask people, and of course it's truer at this moment perhaps than what it's been in my lifetime, that if you ask people about their hope for the future, they have very, very little hope for the future. Maybe if they're, you know, depending upon finances, they're looking at the stock market and wondering if they're going to have anything when they retire. Or maybe they're wondering if they're going to have a job in a few weeks or a few months or if they're going to have enough to pay the bills and they are consumed from a financial end. There are a lot of people that are worried about their health right now and worried about what happens if they, they catch this virus or if not this virus, something else because ultimately our, our bodies do fail us and they do start to break down. So people have fear over that. People have fear because they see what's going on in their families and, and they wonder if you know, their family is being torn apart by various things that are a part of sin, part of our culture, and destroy the family. And of course, right now in our culture, there's a lot of fear over what tomorrow brings, what the future holds. But you know what? One of the beautiful things about being saved is the very fact that your greatest hope is not in this life. In fact, Paul says that if we had hope in this life only, we would be among all men the most pitiable, the most miserable, the King James says. We would be miserable, pitiable people if all we had was hope in this moment and in this life. But we don't. Our hope is beyond this life. Our hope is in what is to come. If you really have the right perspective as a Christian, you understand that right now is our work period. It's our day when we are working for the kingdom of God. It's a brief period of turmoil and strife here on earth, of labor, but our rest comes and our reward comes in the future. And so we have this beautiful promise and our greatest hope, what the Bible calls a lively hope and a sure hope and a glorious hope. All of that hope is in the resurrection. It's in the rapture. It's in an eternity with Jesus Christ. And so even death does not leave us with, uh, with an end, but rather it is the beginning of what we are looking forward to. I've seen more than a few Christians over the last few days that have expressed a sentiment that I too have felt, and that is, it feels like a good day to go home. I'm ready to go home. What are they saying? They're saying that this world has nothing for me, and Lord, I'm ready to go and to be with you. That's a kind of hope that you simply cannot get from this world, from this culture, from a godless culture that says there's no reason why you're here and there's nothing to anticipate when you're gone, but we have a beautiful, lively, blessed hope to look forward in the future, and that brings us peace. Right now, in a time of social isolation, social distancing as we call it, there's a lot of people that are feeling very, very alone. We don't realize that on a day-to-day -day basis of how much we value contact with other humans. And of course, right now, without that contact, there's a lot of people that are feeling very lonely. But if you are a believer, I want you to know today that Christ dwelling in your heart means that you are never, never alone. Jesus promised that he would never leave us and never forsake us, that he would be closer than a brother. And so at every moment in life, we are never truly alone. We don't have to just rely on ourselves. We don't have to have all of the answers. We don't have to have it all figured out because we have Jesus and we have hope in him. The Christian does nothing alone. Jesus is constantly with us. He strengthens us. He watches over us. He protects us. He heals us. He provides for us. You see, the thing is, is that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that word Lord means master. It means he becomes the boss. He's in charge. But along with that, it becomes his responsibility to take care of you. 
And so if you are a child of God right now, you're not alone in this. And furthermore, it's God's responsibility to take care of you, and He will. The final thing that we have is no uncertainty. Everybody has dreams and ambitions. We all had an idea in our head of how our lives were supposed to go and to turn out. And many people have been really disenchanted and been frustrated by the fact that things have not worked out according to their plans. They feel stress and worry over trying to make their dreams and ambitions come to life. And that's compounded right now when they feel thwarted in so many ways of trying to bring about their plan for the future. But the Christian knows that everything is in the hands of God and that He will make everything work for our good even the things that we don't understand like this. And we can trust that when we don't understand, that He does understand. And because we are in His hands, we don't have to fear anything. There is nothing that is beyond His control. Right now, God is in 100% control. There is nothing happening on this planet that is outside of His scope or outside of His abilities. And our governments are they're, they're being pulled apart trying to figure out how to handle this. But God is, don't worry about God. He's not overwhelmed right now. He hasn't you know, extended past His task force. He's not looking for answers. He knows all things right now. God is in control. We read in that definition that there is a certain peace that comes from salvation. There's no uncertainty. Peter says that we can make our calling and our election sure. I can tell you right now with confidence that I know that I'm saved. I know that I have a hope and a future. I know that if the Lord returns right now, I am ready to be with Him. And that hope comes from my salvation from knowing in whom I have believed and knowing that He is in control of everything. And so the conditions for my peace are not dependent on everything going right. Like you, there's a lot of things that I would have liked to have gone differently over the last few weeks. There are things that if I were in control, I would have said I would prefer to have gone this way and I wouldn't have wanted this to happen. But I can also tell you that even while a lot of things have not gone the way that I wanted, I still have peace in my heart because my trust is in Jesus Christ and He has control. And that is the very reason why the world cannot understand our peace. Because the world's peace is predicated upon their environment, of having things go the way that they want, of them being in control or at least perceiving themselves to be in control. But God's peace is predicated solely upon two things. He's in control of everything. And number two, He loves you. He cares for you. He knows the very hairs, number of the hairs upon your head. He cares for all of the little details. And He promises, for example, in Matthew 6 and 33, that if we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that all these things shall be added unto you. And Jesus said again and again for us to not be concerned over these little things because our Heavenly Father knows that we need them. And He has promised that He will take care of us. We don't have to fear what this current crisis brings or what a future crisis might bring because God is always going to be in control. And we can simply take it to God in prayer. In our opening text, we read Philippians 4, 6. And I want to end with this passage of Scripture. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Right now, your heart and your mind may need some protection right now. You may be full of chaos and turmoil, but I want you to know that if you will take it to God, if you'll make your request known to God and thank Him, you can only thank Him if you believe He listens and He is going to respond. But if you can take it to God, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I want to ask you to bow your head with me right now and let's allow God's Word to settle into our hearts. Let's go to Him in prayer. Lord, I come before you right now. I thank you that we have a Heavenly Father who cares for us. I thank you that in the midst of this crisis that we have a blessed hope in you that we can have peace. And Lord Jesus, I pray right now, God, for those who are afraid. 
God, those that are full, Lord Jesus, of fear and anxiety within their hearts, wondering what will become of them, what will become of our country. Lord, so much fear and so much uncertainty is out there. But I pray in the midst of this that we would be able to bring these things before your throne, God, and confess our fears and our doubts before you. And ask God, let your peace flow into me. I'm thankful that I have you to turn to. I'm thankful that I have a, a loving Heavenly Father who cares about me, who so loves the world. And I pray right now, Lord, I'm asking for your peace. Peace that passes all understanding. Perfect peace to flood into our hearts and minds right now. God, I pray over every home, Lord, over every individual, Lord Jesus. God, that they would feel your peace, Lord, flow into their lives right now. God, that they would recognize that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I pray, oh God, that your peace, God, right now would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'm so thankful that you are in control, that you are a loving Father, a loving Master, a loving Lord, and you are going to take care of us. We put our hope and our trust in you right now. In Jesus' name. I want to challenge you this evening, 6.30 p.m., that you will take the time to gather your family around you and to have a prayer meeting during that time. Go to the Lord in prayer. Guard your hearts and minds by taking things to the Lord. And pray not just for yourselves, but our community right now is full of people who are hurting and who are afraid. But there is an answer for them. There is a Savior who loves them and cares for them. Hold them up in prayer. And I believe that God is going to do wonderful things in our community and in our church during this time. God bless you. The Lord Jesus be with you. Amen. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there.